In the last two episodes of The Atomic Bomb, we explored the Hiroshima bomb to see how it was made and how it worked. In this episode, we'll be accompanying the bomb to the Pacific to look at the challenges that still lay ahead to deliver it to target and get it to explode. As we're going to see, the destruction of Hiroshima was by no means a sure thing. Before we get going, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you enjoy this kind of history documentary content. And hit that thumbs up button if you like this video. Thanks. The U.S. never conducted a test of the uranium gun bomb, the little boy bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. It didn't have enough uranium for that. Almost all the U-235 that the Manhattan Project had processed up to that point went into building that one bomb. A single atomic bomb test was conducted prior to the mission to Japan, the Trinity Test, in the New Mexico desert on July 16, 1945. But that was of the plutonium bomb, the implosion-type bomb that would be used at Nagasaki. The implosion design was much more complex. Its designers were not nearly so confident that it would work, so a test was considered essential. But here's the thing. The Trinity test, which was of course successful, was a static test. The bomb wasn't dropped from a plane as it would be in combat to self-detonate when it reached the optimal height above the ground. It was mounted atop a tower and triggered directly, with all the risks and uncertainties of combat delivery removed. As we saw in the previous episode, the essential core of the little boy uranium bomb was the gun barrel and nose assembly with the uranium loaded inside. Strip off the outer bomb casing and all the electronics, and this is all that you needed to wipe out a city. It alone could have been loaded into a B-29 bomber and flown to Japan and manually detonated over the target, a suicide mission, and it would have worked just fine. Its designers were so sure it would work that their estimates of success ranged as high as a million to one. A Trinity-style test of the gun bomb, therefore, wasn't needed. The gun design was certain to work. There was no way it couldn't. It was guaranteed. What wasn't guaranteed was the delivery system. This is where almost all the risks came in for the Hiroshima mission to be a colossal failure. Dropping the bomb from 30,000 feet and having it fall to the earth and then detonate at the predetermined height of 2,000 feet, calculated as optimal for inflicting maximum devastation, was a complex procedure. As you can get a glimpse of in this photo, the interior of the bomb was packed with electronic components to achieve this. There were four radar units, four for redundancy, with battery boxes attached. There was a mass of wiring, a thing called a clock box that looked like this inside, and a barometric switch that, together with the clock box and radar units, formed the bomb's fusing system, its proximity fuse. All these parts, all this technology, which was essentially replacing a human finger on the trigger, had to work right for the bomb to explode. The job of delivering the bomb to Japan was assigned to a special bomber unit under Colonel Paul Tibbets, known as the 509th Composite Group. The 509th, consisting of 15 B-29 bombers, trained at Wendover Airfield in Utah, then was transferred to the Pacific at the beginning of July 1945 to the island of Tinian in the Mariana Islands. Throughout this entire period, 509th bomber crews practiced for the mission to Japan, dropping test units, dummy bombs, 
into the Salton Sea in California, and then into the Pacific Ocean and on Japan itself, after relocating to Tinian Island. Here's a little boy test unit, loaded into a B-29 bomb bay. And here's a fat man test unit, nicknamed a pumpkin. Some were packed with high explosives. Others were outfitted with a smoke device to signal detonation. Both used the exact same triggering mechanism that would detonate the Hiroshima bomb. It usually worked, but sometimes it didn't. Here's what Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who would pilot the B-29 Enola Gay to Hiroshima to drop the bomb, remembers. It was ironic that when the scientists were preoccupied with the chances of a successful atomic explosion, the fusing mechanism was the real headache. It failed twice during practice runs, setting off the gunpowder-filled pumpkins soon after they left the plane. No harm was done. Luis Alvarez, a scientist attached to the project, witnessed one such practice run where a test unit failed. I watched, with field glasses, the bomb being dropped from a B-29 flying over the ocean, north of Tinian Island, and we were simultaneously listening to radio signals from the bomb. At a certain height above the ocean, the proximity fuses were to send out a signal indicating detonation and also release some puffs of smoke. You can imagine our consternation when neither the signal was emitted nor were the puffs of smoke visible. The dummy bomb simply splashed into the ocean. Lieutenant Morris Jepson, a member of the Enola Gay crew and directly involved with arming and monitoring the bomb during the mission, recalled that on the eve of the Hiroshima mission, quote, there was a lot of concern that the fusing was not reliable. So that was the first risk, failure of the bomb's fuse, its trigger. The second risk was human error. The various components of the bomb were sent out to Tinian in separate shipments. The gun mechanism and the projectile were sent by sea aboard the U.S. Navy cruiser Indianapolis. The uranium target rings were divided up into three separate shipments and were sent by air aboard three separate aircraft. After all these components had arrived, the bomb was then assembled on Tinian in this building, the so-called Bomb Assembly Shed. All the time and money that had gone into the Manhattan Project the Los Alamos Project in New Mexico, all the brilliant minds that had designed the world's deadliest weapon, the massive uranium enrichment complex that was built at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, including the biggest building in the world up to that time, all that calculation, all that precision, all that perfection, it all came down to a handful of guys sweating in a shed on Tinian, turning wrenches and hammering metal to put the bomb together and load it into the plane. All kinds of human error could have entered into the picture at this point. And there was more. Taking off from Tinian's north field in an overloaded B-29 was very risky. It took a lot of fuel to fly the 3,000-plus mile round trip to Japan, carrying a huge load of bombs or a single, massive little boy bomb weighing almost five tons. B-29s crashed on takeoff on a regular basis, four of them in just the single week prior to the Hiroshima mission. Crashes were such a common occurrence that it was decided at the last minute that it would be too risky for the Enola Gay to take off with the atomic bomb fully armed. Captain William Deke Parsons would complete the delicate arming procedure only after the Enola Gay was safely airborne. The Manhattan Project's top man on Tinian, Brigadier General Thomas Farrell, authorized the procedure and asked Parsons if he knew how to do it. No, sir, Parson replied, but I have all afternoon to learn. So all the planning, all the effort, 
all the calculations, all the expertise that went into the little boy bomb came down to an unfamiliar last-minute procedure performed by a guy in the dark, cramped bomb bay of a B-29. Yet another point where human error could have easily occurred. Okay, so the Enola Gay is airborne, en route to Japan, and Captain Parsons and Lieutenant Jepson, to their great credit, have successfully completed the arming procedure down in the bomb bay. The atomic bomb is operational and ready to go. The mission, however, is still a long way from complete. It's 1,500 miles to Hiroshima, six and a half hours of flight time. And the Boeing Superfortress B-29, it's not the most reliable plane in the world. It had only been in service for about a year, a massive, extremely complex machine, and it had problems. Its biggest problem was its right cyclone engines, which had a tendency to catch on fire particularly when they were maxed out on takeoff and straining at high altitude. A B-29 had four of these engines, four times the potential for trouble. And when one of them caught on fire, that was not good. A B-29 engine fire was particularly dangerous because the right cyclone engine had a lot of magnesium in it. Magnesium was used because it was light, it saved weight. The downside was that it could burn. If a B-29 engine swallowed a valve, for example, a relatively common occurrence, and developed a fire, the flames could spread to the magnesium itself in the engine. The crankcase and other magnesium parts could start to burn. And magnesium, when it catches fire, it burns hot, white hot, so hot that an engine could melt right through the wing. When that happened, the plane itself was a goner. If a fuel tank didn't explode, the wing itself could fall off. If this had happened to the Enola Gay, the last communication received from the aircraft would have been the numerical code 25, which meant returning with unit due to damage to aircraft. If an engine fire or other mishap occurred over Japan, the pilot, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, had cyanide tablets in the pocket of his flight suit to distribute to the crew. Of course, none of that happened. The Enola Gay made it to Hiroshima without incident and dropped the bomb at 8.15 in the morning of August 6, 1945. And the world's first field-deployed nuclear weapon worked to perfection. The mission was an unqualified success. This is an aspect of the atomic bomb story that really deserves to be highlighted. The sheer audacity of the mission. An entirely new weapon, a jury-rigged prototype never before tested, was rushed into combat under extremely trying conditions passed through multiple layers of possible human error and possible mechanical failure, and it actually worked. Here's an interesting thought. What would have happened if the Enola Gay had dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and it didn't explode? The bomb fell from the plane, reached the predetermined altitude of 1,890 feet, and then the proximity fuse had failed, and it just kept falling and smacked into the ground. What would have happened? Would the bomb still have exploded? The answer is yes. The little boy gun bomb was nose-heavy. It fell with its nose pointing down, so it would have impacted with the ground nose first. The impact, at about 150 miles per hour, would have driven the uranium projectile down the gun barrel and into the uranium target to create a supercritical mass. And that would have initiated a chain reaction and in turn an explosion. This explosion, though, wouldn't have been nearly as large as intended because the projectile, driven by momentum alone, would have been moving relatively slowly, 
at scarcely a quarter of the optimal speed. The result? Well, the blast would have created a good-sized crater and damaged the center of Hiroshima, an area probably less than a kilometer across. And the uranium in the bomb would have been vaporized and spread all over the city. Because uranium-235 is not very radioactive, however, this fallout that would have rained down on the inhabitants of Hiroshima would not have been very deadly. Little Boy, in short, would have been a not very effective dirty bomb. In the next episode of The Atomic Bomb, we're going to switch our perspective to the Japanese side and ask the question, what did the Japanese know? Were they caught completely off guard when Hiroshima was destroyed? Or did they have an inkling that something massive, something terrible, was coming? I'm Sam Hawley. See you next time.